Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha Kaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Paschatya Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare So good evening everyone. Welcome to the Ishopanishad class. Everyone can hear me okay? Good evening, Maharaj. Okay. Yes, All right, very good. So uh, let's see now. We'll do a little revision. Uh, wait, let me go to PowerPoint. Is everyone able to see this? Yes, Maharaj, very clearly. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. Okay, remember section one? What's the first section? Mantras one to three? What's the subject matter? Who can say? One person? Who's going to say? Rukmini Pati Prabhu. Kota Maharaj, everyone what? has to have their own Kota, they cannot be too busy and take everything. Okay, everybody. And what happens if you take more than your quota? What happens if you just take uh, your quota? If you just take we your... Come, uh, and we come engrossed in the material conception and we, and we, we, we lose our uh, uh, spiritual uh, activities, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the first part? What's the first mantra? Do you know the first mantra yet? Have you memorized it yet? No, Maharaj. Really? You haven't memorized it? Everybody chant with me. Isavashyam idam sarvam. Yakincha jagat yam jagat. Tena chak tena bunjitaha. Tena tena bunjitaha. Magridaha kashasvidanam. Magridaha kashasvidanam. Anybody know the translation? Anybody memorize translation yet? Anyone? Punita. Punita is here. 
Huh? Hare Krishna. Uh, I will try, Maharaj. Everything animate and inanimate that is within this universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. Yes, that's the first half. Very good. Everybody should have to get this part right. Everything animate and inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. Therefore, therefore, one should only take what is necessary, set aside for him, uh, set aside as the quota. Right. Therefore, one should accept only those things necessary for himself. One should not accept more, knowing well to whom they belong. Right? And then the, sec yes. the second mantra describes what happens if you do that, if you just take your quota, what's the result? What does the second mantra say? What will be the result? One may aspire to live for hundreds of years if he goes on doing work in that way. In other words, you have a long life, <laughs> right? You get a long life. That's what the mantra said. And if you don't follow that, if you take more than your quota, what's the result? Mantra 3 says, you enter into the worlds of the faithless, full of darkness and ignorance. Okay, so first mantra, first section describes the proprietorship, that the, the Lord is the supreme proprietor, and then the laws of God, the laws of God that we should take what we need, don't take more. If you take more, you get, you suffer, <laughs> you get reactions. And if you just take your quota, you get good results. Section 2, ma mantras 4 to 8, what's being described? Anybody remember? Very quiet. I can't hear you. Anybody there? Yes, we should vision of the Mahabhagavata. Yes, a vision of the Mahabhagavata. So, what's the vision of the Mahabhagavata? How does he see all living entities? With qualities, with one with love. Yeah, in quality, one with the Lord, right? Different in quantity, but yes. in quality, one with the yes. Lord. And how does he see the Lord? See oneness by hearing God with you. Yes. Huh? How does he see the Lord? Ekadvan Anupashtata. Ekadvan Anupashtata means in quality one with the Lord. But then Mantra 8 goes on to describe his vision, how he sees the Supreme Lord. What are some of the, qual yes. the qualities of the Lord? He has a spiritual body. Yeah, he is, he's unembodied. Unembodied, so he's a spiritual without body. He's without veins, yeah. Well, that's not mentioned in the verse. But he, Yes, well, omnipotent, yes. Each of the senses can perform the actions of other senses. And remember, shudam uh, apapa vidam, right? Shudam apapa vidam, meaning? He shudam. Shudam means antiseptic. And apapa vidam means probably sin cannot touch. Yeah, like that pure, Shuddham is pure and Apapvidam, un uncontaminated, cannot be, un cannot be contaminated or antiseptic and prophylactic, right. So that's how he sees the Supreme Lord, like that, the vision of the Mahabhagavata, right, great devotee. Or. And then next section, mantras 9 to 14. We're looking first of all at the absolute and the relative. Absolute knowledge and then relative knowledge. 
the first three mantras were describing like this. So we were hearing uh, absolute knowledge is called vidya and relative knowledge is avidya. So when you what is the purpose of education? We generally think education, you go to a college, you get some qualification, you study something. It, it, what kind of knowledge are you getting there? Avidya. Avidya, yes, Avidya, right. We're, we're getting on. But what is the real purpose of education? Uh, spiritual knowledge, Vidya. Well, character building, Maharaj. Yes, character building, that's right. You, you should develop our character. We go for education. You want to develop character. This Krishna conscious movement is meant for developing people of good character, right? Good character, that's real knowledge. And what are the signs that a person has got good character? What will be some of his qualities? I cannot hear you, your voice is not clear. You have to say it again, it's not clear yet. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Hare Krishna. Is it humility and pridelessness? Yes, that's the first items of knowledge. Very good. Humility and pridelessness. Yes. Any more qualities? He should not cause trouble to anybody. Okay. They should men should be trained as brahmachari. They should be trained as brahmachari to control their senses. If they're good brahmacharis, then they can make good householders also. Not that because they're brahmachari they cannot marry, but they'll be good husbands and good fathers when they're good brahmacharis. So brahmachari training is important. But today young men, they don't want to be brahmacharis, they don't want that kind of training. They don't have, they're not developed humility, they haven't got good character, so the education is not good. So this kind of education is required, and we were reading the different qualities, beginning with humility and pridelessness, and then accepting a spiritual master. What should be the result of all that? What, what, what kind of results will come about by getting training in the brahmachari and taking a spiritual master and being humble and without pride, then what will be the result? Become an unalloyed devotee of Guru. Yes, they'll become pure devotees, they'll become unalloyed devotees. And when they become good devotees, they will also have... What, what, what happens when somebody becomes a devotee? What qualities follow along with devotion? Along with devotion comes two things, knowledge and detachment, jnana and vairagya, or knowledge and detachment, knowledge of the absolute and detachment from the material. These two things come where there is real devotion, pure devotion, right? So we were talking yesterday oh and the day before we heard about people who are who have knowledge but it's all wrong knowledge the, the, and and they teach people but they teach them the wrong things so do you know some of these people who do this kind of thing they're miseducators they're teaching, but they're teaching the wrong thing, the wrong w answers. Na Nandini, Nandini, do you know? Yes, Maharaj. 
Yes, Maharaj. Tell me then. Veda Vajarata. Yeah. Who are they? Who is Veda Vajarata? A one who knows or claims to know Vedas, but they are diverted from the purpose of the Vedas. Okay. And the other one? Maya Aparita Jnana. Yeah, Maya Aparita Jnana means what? They are self-made gods. Self-made gods. Yeah, the, 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 one, the, one, the actual meaning of Maya Aparita Jnana is knowledge. One who's not stolen by illusion. Yes, knowledge stolen by illusion. Yeah. So, yeah, they, pr they may t pretend, they may take, say that they're God and like that, or they're the Acharya, but they don't follow anything. Like, but there's another person also, who is also a miseducator. <laughs> Prabhupada said, the, 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 the atheistic demon, if one is atheistic wow. demon, he's also, <laughs> he's also uh, a, a miseducator. Three kinds of people, mis teaching the people the wrong things. The atheistic demon, the Veda Vadarata, people who mouth the Vedas, and the Maya Aparita Jnana, whose knowledge is stolen by illusion. So then yesterday we spoke about balancing Vidya and Avidya. So one who knows both Vidya and Avidya, then he can transcend the, the wheel of birth and death. So we have to know about Vidya. How do we know that? How do we learn about Vidya? By hearing from a Dira. Yes, very good. And what will the Dira be speaking from? From authoritative sources, which is from disciplic succession. Okay, what kind of books will they be speaking from? Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes, right. They'll be preaching the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad. And how do we learn about Avidya, Avidya then? Avidya is material education. Also, do we need to go? Do we need to go to? Do we need to go to the college to get this knowledge of avidya? Maybe we need to go into the material world and go and associate with all the karmis and all the mudhas, go with all the atmahas, all the people who kill the souls. Then we'll learn more about avidya. Is it? No, but the cultivation of avidya is needed to just to maintain the body healthy. So, how do we do that? Maharaj, can I answer? Yes. Uh, do our daily activities with regulated senses? Yeah, that's part of it. But how do we learn all this? <laughs> well, we have to practice those 18 items of knowledge. Those 18 items of knowledge will help us to develop all the knowledge of both Vidya and Avidya. Just like in Krishna Consciousness, you know, we learn about cleanliness. We learn like when people come to the… they, they often don't know to eat prasadam just with the right hand. And maybe the, before they became devotees, they were meat eaters, they were using two hands. They don't know you're supposed to eat with the right hand and don't touch prasadam with the left hand. They don't know these things. And they don't know about taking your shoes off when you go in, going in the home or into the temple. They don't know about taking bath regularly even, and especially after going to the toilet, you have to take a bath and these kind of things. Cleanliness, so cleanliness is taught in the Krishna Consciousness Movement. And uh, we also learn, as we said, good character. How do we develop the good character? 
No, by being in the in the, the pure atmosphere, by being in the atmosphere which is influenced by the mode of goodness, then it will help us to develop the good qualities and to know what is the proper standard of behavior. Waking up early in the morning is also important. So the, this is all things which we learn in the Krishna consciousness movement. We learn to keep everything clean, like we, we wash our cloth every day and we, we clean up, clean the kitchen nicely after cooking. And so many things as devotees we, we learn we learn to be regulated, we learn not to speak harshly, not to speak nasty words, to speak properly, to speak the truth. These kind of things, this is cultivating avidya, this is all avidya, this kind of knowledge. It's not transcendental knowledge, but it's mundane knowledge, right? And we also learn to practice religion. Right? What, what, is the pur what, what, what is the purpose of religion? Do you remember? We, we heard yesterday. Pe First realization, Mother. Yeah, people sometimes think religion is you go to temple and you pray to God to give you a good home, to give you a new job, to give you money, to give you a child, and these kind of things, you know? We go to God to ask something, but actually re real religion is meant for self-realization, right? To understand ourself and our relationship with God, right? That's real religion. So religion, economic development, we have to have some income, we have to work, we have to do some business or something, find some way in which we can maintain our life, so economic development is required and with economic development then sense gratification, we are allowed sense gratification. Prabhupada said sense gratification is like salt, just like when you cook. If you put too much salt in the food, it's no good. And if there's no salt, oh, it's also no good. So the salt has to be just right. So sense gratification. Remember what is sense gratification? What activities are sense gratification? Eating, sleep, eating. Sleep. Yes. What else? Eating, sleeping only. What else? Meeting, eating. Yes, right. Yeah, we, we have to do these things. These things go on, but they're regulated and controlled. Right? That's, that is a part of the avidya, part of the avidya education, that we learn what to eat and what not to eat. And we learn also how much to sleep. And we learn also how to produce good children, how to have good children in, in the religious way. So all of this goes on. This, this is cult of the culture of vid, avidya and vidya, mundane knowledge along with spiritual knowledge. Okay? So today we're going to go on to the second part, the terms of worship. We'll hear about the worship, different demigods and impersonalism and these kind of things. So this is a, an important part of the Ishupanishad, 9 to 14, in terms of knowledge and then in terms of worship. And then the final section, which we'll do at the end, prayer at the time of death. Okay? So, the Absolute and the Relative, in terms of knowledge, andam tamaha pravishanti yevityam upasyate tatabhu yaivate tamo yauvidyam rata. Okay, so we studied this.
modern civilization has advanced considerably mass education, but people are more unhappy than ever before because of the stress placed on material advancement to the exclusion of the most important part of life, the spiritual aspect. The advancement of learning by godless people is as dangerous as a jewel on the head of a cobra. Cobra decorated with a jewel is more dangerous than one not decorated. A godless civilization directed towards so-called advancement of education is more dangerous than a civilization in which the mass of people are less educated. And we are asked, how would you present this statement to a modern audience? So we have to explain to them the importance of character and how the modern, modern, modern education does not produce people of good character. But we consider character is very important because it's character which will impress a person more than just education, material qualification. Person may be materially educated, but he may be of the lowest character. And we see the example in Krishna Leela, remember how Kamsa was ready to kill Vasudev because he, the, there was a voice from the sky. He told Kamsa that, Oh Kamsa, you're such a fool. The eighth child of your sister Devaki will kill you. So when Kamsa heard this, he was going to kill his sister Devaki. But Vasudev was there. Vasudev had just married Devaki. So Vasudev told Kamsa, Oh no, please don't kill her. And he preached to him about the soul and so on. He preached philosophy. But still Kamsa was going to kill Devaki. But then he promised Kamsa that, look, I will give you the, our children. After our children are born, I'll give them to you. You can take them, do what you like with them. But please don't kill my wife. And so when Kamsa heard this, he agreed. Because he considered character to be more important. So the, he trusted the character of Vasudev. The philosophy didn't matter much to him, but the character was important. So character impresses people more, more than just education. So some people may be well educated, but lowest character, not good. Mantra 10. Oh. One should become a perfect gentleman, learn to give proper respect, right? Amanitvam, adambitvam, humility, prideless, be humble. Young men are very proud. They're in the bodily concept. Wrong type of education. Education based on the body. How, would, how should you relate to senior devotees? May not have completed a Bhakti Shastri degree. We should be humble, right? Humility is very important. If we can all be humble, we, so we must try to think of ourselves in terms of our spiritual dimension. One ten thousand, the tip of the hair, that is our actual size. And then mantra 11, the process of nations side by side can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death. So don't make one-sided attempts. Don't just go only on the material. We need to also cultivate spiritual knowledge. We have to understand the soul. And we have to understand at the same time the needs of the body. You can't neglect the body. You have to take care of it. But we need also spiritual knowledge. If we just have only material knowledge, then it's no good. So we have a balanced program. We have to have both. The just, we give the example, the train goes on two tracks, one, one for the, the spiritual knowledge, one for the material knowledge. If you just have only one track or the tracks are not level, what will happen? Train will turn over, 
right? You get the train turning over sometimes because the tracks are not level. So there must be a balanced program between the material and the spiritual. Is it all right? How does the process given by Śrīla Prabhupāda enable us achieve, to achieve a balanced program, spiritual and material knowledge? Well, that's, that, that is the Krishna conscious program. Wake up early in the morning, chant Hare Krishna, and then morning program, hear Srimad Bhagavatam, then work. Do, do some service for Krishna, go to job or work in the temple, clean, do the cooking, deity worship, many things. So balanced program, spiritual and material. Okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead. Let me finish this. Any questions? No? Everybody okay? Okay, we're going to go ahead. We have to go up to the next mantra. Engaged text number 12, right? Everybody ready? Who's going to read? Let me see who's not read for a while. Oh, yeah. Mad Madhuri Tulsi Mariji. Yes, Maharaj, I read. Okay, read the Sanskrit first, one line at a time. Andam tama pravishanti. Andam tama pravishanti. Yesam bhuti upasate. Yesam bhuti upasate. Tato bhuya iva te tamo. Tato bhuya iva te tamo. Yayu Sambhutyam Rataha. Yayu Sambhutyam Rataha. Okay, go ahead, translation. Those who are engaged in the worship of demigods enter into the darkest region of ignorance, and still more so do the worshippers of the impersonal absolute. The Sanskrit word. Asambhuti refers to those who have no independent existence. Sambhuti is the absolute personality of Godhead who is absolutely independent of everything. In the Bhagavad Gita, the 10, chapter 10, text 2, the absolute personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna states, Nami Vido Suragana Prabhavamina Maharshayaha Asam Adirhi Devanam Maharsinam Sa Sarvasaha. Neither the host of demigods nor the great sages know my origin of opulences. For in every aspect I am the source of the demigods and sages. Thus, Krishna is the origin of the powers delegated to demigods, great sages, and mystics. Although they are endowed with great powers, these powers are limited. And thus, it is very difficult for them to know how Krishna himself appears by his own internal potency in the form of a man. Okay, so we hear about demigods. Who are these demigods? Can you tell me the names of some of these demigods? I think in Malaysia we don't, we don't say usually demigods, we will say devas. We say the deva temple. But in Krishna Consciousness, we always say de demigods. Prabhupada calls them demigods. But in Malaysia, the Hindu Sangam especially, they don't like this. They say, it's not fair, you shouldn't say like that, they're devas. 
So, who was, yes, Maharaj. So, who uh, are they? Varuna, Indra. Varuna, Indra. Kartikeya. Kartikeya. Ganesh. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about Lord Shiva? Yeah, Lord Shiva. What about <laughs> Marimam? Marimam? Marimam, yes, Maharaj. Mm. So how many demigods are there? Do you know? Thirty-three million. Thirty-three million. Three hundred thirty million demigods. Huh? Thirty-three legs. Three hundred and thirty million. Thirty-three crore. Right. Oh, thirty-three crore. A crore, a, a crore is one crore is ten million. So thirty-three crores. Yeah. So. So many demigods, right? Of course, we know the main ones. There are some main ones. And, and there are great sages also. So there's demigods, great sages and mystics. And Krishna is the origin of all of them. So, although they are endowed with great power, these powers are limited. Very difficult for them to know how Krishna himself appears in the form of a man by his own internal potency. So we can understand how Krishna is so much greater than all of these demigods and great sages and mystics. Look, Krishna is the super. He's a, he said, not neither the demigods nor the sages know about Krishna. They don't know Krishna's origin or his opulences. Why? Because Krishna is the source of it. They all come from him. Just like we don't know much about our mother and father because we come from them. We don't know them. <laughs> we don't know much about them. And so same way the great sages and the yogis, the demigods, they all come from Krishna. Can you go ahead, Maharaji, read the next paragraph? Yes, Maharaj. Many philosophers and great rishis or mystics try to distinguish the absolute from the relative by their tiny brain power. This can only help them reach the negative conception of the absolute without realizing any positive trace of the absolute. Definition of the absolute by negation is not complete. Such negative definition lead one to create a concept of one's own. Thus, one imagines that the absolute must be formless and without qualities. Such negative qualities are simply the, the reversals of relative. Material qualities and are therefore also relative. By conceiving of the absolute in this way, one can at the utmost reach the impersonal effulgence of God known as Brahman. But one cannot make further progress to Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead. Okay, so Prabhupada is talking here about the Absolute. Absolute means, who is, that? Who is the Absolute ultimately? What is this uh, Absolute? Personality of Godhead, Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yeah, Maharaj. like that. Yeah, the Absolute. The, the, he's the, the Personality of Godhead. Just another way of describing the Personality of Godhead. He's Absolute. So the Absolute from the, the Relative. Absolute means Supreme in all situations. And the Relative it's like the demigods, they're, you know, sometimes they're supreme, some different aspects they're supreme, but they're, they're small, they're not, they're not like the Absolute. So some people try to understand the Absolute, Prabhupada says they make a negative conception, try to understand the Absolute by negative conception. And what they, they, they do such things like they imagine the Absolute must be, how, how do they consider the Absolute? By negative conception? What do, they, what do they do? They think that the Absolute will not have a form. He won't be a person. He won't have form qualities. 
So they say, no, no form, no qualities, no person, no, no hands, no eyes, no legs. They say like that, this is negative definitions. They say, oh, he cannot walk, he cannot talk, he cannot, he cannot hear, he cannot see, like this. Okay, back again, here we go. This is how the impersonalists do like this. They want to negate everything. They say, no, he cannot be a person. Why not? Because I'm a person. So the absolute, he must be greater than me. I'm a person, so he cannot be a person. He must be something else. So like that, they say, no, nope, he's not a person. I have a form. If he has a form, his form must be like mine. They cannot understand that he has a spiritual form and they think he has no qualities because I have qualities so they think if he has qualities then he would be a person like me. But no, he has spiritual qualities. So they make, they try to make everything negation, no, no form, no person, no qualities, cannot talk, cannot walk, they, they like this. So this is not how to understand. This is not the correct way to understand the Absolute. So if we try to understand that way, the only way, only thing they'll come to know is the Brahman, the impersonal effulgence, which is called the Brahman, the Brahman. They'll know the Brahman, but they won't know Bhagavan. That's the problem. They'll only know one part of the Absolute. Remember the elephant? We were talking about the elephant. Do you know the elephant? They only know one part of the elephant. They don't know the whole part. So some people only know the Brahman. They don't know the Bhagavan. So this is the impersonalism. They try to understand by negation. They cannot be a person. I'm a person. But they can be a spiritual person. So we want them to understand these things. Okay, we'll go ahead. Somebody else can read. Uh, who's, who's not read for a while here? Oh. Suryanga Chaitanya Prabhu. Yeah, you can read. Okay, Maharaj. Such mental speculators do not know that the absolute personality of Godhead is Krishna, that the impersonal Brahman is the glaring effulgence of his transcendental body, or that the Paramatma, the super soul, is his all pervading plenary representation. Nor do they know that Krishna has his No, uh, Krishna, so I cannot see Maharaj, that, uh, Maharaj, I cannot see the pair. You cannot see? Pair say, uh, Nor do, nor they... do they, Krishna has his eternal form with its transcendental of eternal bliss and knowledge. The defect may gods and great sages imperfectly consider him to be a powerful demigod and they consider the Brahman effulgence to be the But the devotees of Krishna, by dint of their surrendering unto him in unalloyed devotion, can know that he is the absolute person and that everything emanates from him. Such devotees continuously render loving service unto Krishna, the fountainhead of everything. Okay, thank you Prabhu. So we're learning some more about Krishna. You see that there are different features of the Absolute, that the Absolute can be Brahman, the Absolute can be Paramatma, and the Absolute can also be Bhagavan. Bhagavan means Krishna, and the Paramatma means the, the Super Soul everywhere, in everyone's heart, in every atom. And the Brahman is just the, the, it's the energy, the light which comes from Krishna's body. 
So these three features are all related to Krishna. So the demigods and great sages, sometimes they cannot understand even, sometimes they also cannot understand Krishna. And sometimes they think Brahman is the absolute truth. But the devotees of Krishna know that the Brahman is only the energy of Krishna, the light, right? The Brahman, you come to the light, the light has a source. You have to get the light. Where does the, the light, where is the power coming from for the light? So this Brahman is the light, it's the, the effulgence. It's coming from the body of Krishna. So we have to go through the light to come to Krishna. Go on to come to Krishna. Okay? So, Tanusha Maharaji, uh, can you read for us, please? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes, okay, I'll read. In the Bhagavad Gita 7.20 and 23, it is said that only unintelligent, bewildered persons driven by a strong desire for sense gratification worship the demigods for the temporary relief of temporary problems. Since the living being is materially entangled, he has to be relieved from material bondage entirely to attain permanent relief on the spiritual plane where eternal bliss, life and knowledge exist. Sri Isopanisa therefore instructs that we should not seek temporary relief of our difficulties by worshipping the dependent demigods who can bestow only temporary benefit. Rather, we must worship the absolute personality of Godhead, Krishna, who is all attractive and who can bestow upon us complete freedom from material bondage by taking us back home, back to Godhead. Okay, so have you ever worshipped the demigods? Did you go to Deva Temple? Earlier, Maharaj. Before, yes. I came. Yeah, before you became devotee, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Which, which temple did you go to? Which deva? Uh, Lord Shiva. Okay, what did you pray for? Uh, pray for a actually, husband? Did you pray for a husband uh, there? No, Maharaj. No? <laughs> because, no? Because I was small at that time, so I didn't pray anything properly. No. Oh, you didn't know to pray? Yes, Maharaj. So, what kind of things can you pray for if you go to Deva Temple? Um, usually, to, usually, what do people pray for when they go? They jobs. Yeah, I want I need a job. So uh, any... They pray for jobs and then they pray, mostly they pray for their sense gratification, Maharaj. Yeah, like what? Like uh, they want to get good, uh, good working, I mean good job, good uh, life partner. Yeah. And then, uh, and then they have, uh, they have all the, or like they want to have good money, good education. Yeah. Pass exams. Yeah, when, before the exam, we go and pray to people, right? Go and pray, pray to Saraswati. Or some people, they come and they pray to Krishna. I know the temple in Calcutta is just beside the Hindi high school. There's one Hindi high school there. So when there's a big exam, all the parents, they'll all come, they'll all pray at the temple. Why? Because their son or their daughter is going, doing a big exam. <laughs> so they come and they pray. And they'll pray also to Saraswati, Saraswati especially, for learning, help pass the exam. At Tirupati, many people come, they shave the head, offer their hair to Balaji before the exam. <laughs> and they come and they, have, they want to get some help. So some people, they pray to the demigods. If we want money, usually we'll pray to who? Lakshmi. 
Lakshmi Devi. Lakshmi, right. And now when... they are praying to Kuvera Maharaj. Ah, now they are pr praying to Kuvera for money, are they? They don't pray to Lakshmi, they pray, pray to Kuvera. Some are praying to Kuvera. Okay. And uh, what about if you want, if you have a health problem, who should you pray to? I'm not sure, Maharaj. Well, you, the, the, the sun god, right? Surya, pray to sun god usually because if you know the sun god, very powerful. You go in the sun, the sunlight, light of the sun is very good for health. So you have some health problems that often people will pray to the sun god. And if we, we, if we uh, want to get some rain, if you're a farmer and you want rain, who do you pray to? Uh, Lord Indra. Right, yeah, do Indra Yagya, right, yeah. So like that, all of these, so what's the problem with praying to all these demigods? Why shouldn't we do this? Uh, because it's only for temporary purpose, Maharaj. Yeah, right, it's only temporary. There'll be something else after that, right? Yes. So. We can only get some temporary benefit if we just pray to the demigods. We go to one god and pray to them, then go to another god and pray to that one. So we see sometimes some temples they have many gods, many gods in the temple. And you ask them which one is the god, they say they're all the god. Hmm? Be because they are thinking, what are they thinking? Because they are thinking that uh, everyone, everyone is the same, so that's why they pray to everyone. <laughs> yeah, they think they're all the same, yeah. They think ultimately only one, all, so they're all the God. <laughs> yeah. Srimad Bhagavatam also tells like that, Atrimuni and Anasuya, they wanted to get the Lord, they wanted to have the Lord as their child. But they had three children, they got three children, and so they said, which one of you is God? And they said, we're all, we're all God. One was Brahma, one was Vishnu, one was Shiva. <laughs> so they said, the three of them said, we're all God. <laughs> so they are, they were. God of the material world, but God, Krishna is the God of the spiritual world. So we should worship Krishna because he will give us real freedom from the material world, take us back to Godhead. Okay? Ram Gopinath Prabhu, you can read for us. It is stated in Bhagavad Gita 7.23 that the worshippers of the demigods can go to the planets of the demigods. The moon worshippers can go to the moon, the sun worshippers to the sun, etc. Modern scientists are now venturing to the moon with the help of rockets, but this is not really a new attempt. With their advanced consciousness, human beings are naturally inclined to travel in outer space and to reach other planets either by spaceships, mystic powers, or demigod worship. In the Vedic scriptures, it is said that one can reach other planets by any one of these three ways. But the most common way is by worshipping the demigod presiding over a particular planet. In this way, one can reach the moon planet, the sun planet, and even Brahma Loka, the topmost planet in this universe. However, all planets in the material universe are temporary residences. The only permanent planet are the Vaikundha Lokas. These are found in the spiritual sky. <coughs> the personality of Godhead himself predominates. predominates. As Lord Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita 
அபிரம்ம அவர்த்தினோ அர்ஜுனா From the highest planet in the material world down to the lowest, all are places of misery, wherein, wherein repeated birth and death take place. But one who attained my abode, O son of Kunti, never takes birth again. Okay, thank you Prabhu. So, Prabhupada is describing, there are three ways to go to the higher planets. Remember? What were the three ways? We want to go to the higher planets. We can go by three ways. The mystic yoga. The mystic power. Um, or by the spaceship, a rocket or something. Or by demigod worship. You worship the demigod, you worship Brahma, you go to Brahma Loka. You worship Shiva, you go to Shiva's planet, Kailash. You worship Indra, you go to the heavenly planets where Indra lives. So what's the problem to go there? Is it good to go there? Let's come back, Maharaj. Yeah, if we go there, there, there's also, there's also death there. You can't stay there forever. You can go there for some time and then you may have to come back. Even you go to Brahma Loka, you may wait there for the end of Lord Brahma's life. L Lord Brahma lives a long life, long time, right? One hundred years. And one day of Brahma's life is a very, very long time on this planet. But Brahma lives a hundred years and then at the end of Brahma's life, then there's annihilation. So then people all, they have to leave Brahma Loka. Some go to the spiritual world and some come back again. They enter into Mahavishnu and then they take birth again. When, when, the, when the night of Brahma is over, when the life of Brahma is over, then there's again creation. And then when there's again creation, then they take birth again, they come back again. So the only permanent place is where? If we don't want birth in the... Yeah, we have to go to the Vaikuntha, Vaikuntha Loka, right? Go there. That's the spiritual world. Vaikuntha means no anxiety. The planets where there is no anxiety, Kunt. Kuntha is anxiety and Vaikunt, no anxiety, the spiritual world, no anxiety, no death, no old age, no disease, no coronavirus, no, very nice place. So you can go there, but we have to be qualified, we have to get rid of, we have to get free from the attachment to this material world. If we are very attached to this world, we come back again. Okay, who's going to read next for us? Anybody? Uh, Mary, you want to read? Mary, not here today? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm here today. Maharaj, I'm here. Are you going to read? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Sri Isopanishad points out that one who worship the demigods and attains to their material planets still remain in the darkest region of the universe. The whole universe is covered by the gigantic material elements. It is just like a coconut covered by a shell and half filled with water. Since its covering is airtight, the darkness within is dense and therefore the sun and the moon are required for illumination. Outside the universe is the once and unlimited Brahma Jyoti expansion, which is filled 
with Vaikuntha Lokas. The biggest and highest planet in the Brahma Jyoti is Krishna Loka or Goloka Vrindavana, where the Supreme Personality of Godhead Sri Krishna himself resides. Lord Sri Krishna never leave Krishna Loka. Although he dwells there with his eternal associates, he is omnipresent throughout the complete material and spiritual cosmic manifestation. This fact has already been explained in Mantra 4. The Lord is present everywhere, just like yet He is situated in one place, just as the sun is situated in its own undeviating orbit. So, Srila Prabhupada is describing to us about the material universe which we are in. Right? Within the material universe, where we are situated, we are like something in a coconut. Just like you get the coconut, it's covered with the shell, you've got some water maybe in the bottom. So this universe is like that. It's, it's a shell and it's very dark and there's different coverings. There's eight coverings, one after another, there are eight coverings. So it's very dark inside. So that's why we have the sun and the moon to give light in the universe. But outside of the universe is the Brahma Jyoti. The Brahma Jyoti, remember we said that's the light, the effulgence which comes from Krishna's body. So that Brahma Jyoti effulgence is spread everywhere and within that light there are the planets called the Vaikuntha Lokas. Loka means the planet, so Vaikuntha Lokas, the planets of the spiritual world. And in that Brahma Jyoti, the biggest and the top, the very top planet is called Goloka Vrindavan or Krishna Loka, where Krishna lives. And we say Krishna never leaves there. His, his residence is there. He never wants, he never leaves there because he has all of his friends there. He has everything he likes there. But by his power, because he is very powerful, he has different potencies. And he's omnipresent. Omnipresent means he's present everywhere throughout the material and the spiritual creation. So therefore, sometimes he appears in different places, in different universes. He comes. And Prabhupada said, just like the sun. The sun is in one place, but the sunlight is everywhere. So Krishna is in one place, in Krishna Loka, but he appears everywhere by his different energy, his appearing. Okay, go ahead. Punita, you can read. Yes, Maharaj. The problems of life cannot be solved simply by going to the moon planet or to some other planet above or below it. Therefore, Sri Ishopanishad advises us not to bother with any destinations within the material universe, but to try to get out of it and reach the effulgent kingdom of God. There are many pseudo-worshippers who become re religionists only for the sake of name and fame. Such pseudo-religionists do not wish to get out of this universe and reach the spiritual sky. They only want to maintain the status quo in the material world under the garb of worshipping the Lord. The atheists and the impersonalists lead such foolish pseudo-religionists into the darkest regions by preaching the cult of atheism. The atheist directly denies the existence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead 
and the impersonalists, uh, impersonalists support the atheist by stressing the impersonal aspect of the Supreme Lord. Thus far, we have not come across any mantra in the Sri Ishopanishad in which the Supreme Personality of Godhead is denied. It is said that he can run faster than anyone. Those who are running after other planets are certainly persons, and if the Lord can run faster than all of them, how can he be impersonal? The impersonal conception of the Supreme Lord is another form of ignorance arising from an imperfect conception of the absolute truth. Okay, thank you. So Prabhupada is talking about these two kinds of people, the atheists and the impersonalists. And he says they lead, they lead such foolish pseudo-religionists into the darkest regions by preaching the cult of atheism. So pseudo-religionists are the first of all, those people pseudo, they're, they're not really religion, religionists, but they, they pretend, they make a show that they're religion, they're religious. And he's probably said, they don't want to get out of the material world. They don't want to go to the spiritual sky. What do they want? What do the pseudo-religionists want? I stay in the material world. Yeah, but in what kind of condition? They want... Name and fame. Name and fame. Yeah, they want to be comfortable, they want name and fame. Yeah, they want to enjoy the material world, right? They're looking for comfort, for pleasure in the material world. They have, they want name and fame. <laughs> yeah, they want it like that. With name and fame then they'll get luxuries and comfort and everything. So they think of religion like that, for that. So there are people called atheists. First of all, atheists, he doesn't believe in God outright. He said, there's no God. And we get a lot of these people. They have even their own groups, their own society. Just like we have a society for Krishna consciousness, the atheists, they have their atheist society. And they make propaganda. They, they try to convince people that there's no God, that why should you believe in God? Oh no, it's not true, it's all both. Atheists are very nasty people sometimes and they can give a lot of trouble. So there are, there are atheists, right? We said, what is the difference between human being and animals? Do you remember, Mary? Uh, as a human being, we we must inquires, inquires, inquire, and inquire about what? Inquires about how, how to serve the Lord. We have the chance to serve the Lord compared to animals. Who uh, we inquire? Who am I? Yeah, we, we, have, we have to ask, who am I? Why am I here? Why am I suffering? Yes. What, yes. Where will I go at the time of death? What will happen to me? Just like when a person dies, what do we say? We will say, they have gone. Huh? We will say, they've gone. They've departed, they've left us, right? What's gone? The body is still there. So what is gone? Soul, Atma. Yeah, the soul. The soul leaves the body. So we have to understand, who am I? Why am I suffering? Why am I here? These questions, right? We should inquire like that. The atheist, he will say, he will say, 
there is no God, there is no one in control. And they will argue that if there's a God, look, why are people suffering? You see everywhere so much suffering. Some people are starving, some people are going uh, no home, some people are very diseased. You think there's a God? If there's a God, why so much suffering? So they cannot understand why there is suffering. And they cannot understand that there's a soul within the body. They're atheists. They, they're like the foolish animal. Just like you get the rabbit. Sometimes the rabbit, what they will do when people are hunting, they will simply close their eyes and think nobody's coming. They will close their eyes. So atheists are like that. They close their eyes. Although we can see God, we can see God everywhere, every, in so many ways, we're, th we're saying there's no God. So the atheists, they don't have the eyes, they don't want to see. Like the owl, the owl closes his eyes in the daytime and he opens his eyes at night. And then at night the owl will say, I never saw any sun, I didn't see the sun. Everyone else said, no, there was a big sun in the sky, it was very hot. But the owl will say, I never saw any sun, because the owl closed his eyes, had his eyes closed all day, so he couldn't see the sun. So atheists are like that. They don't see God. Although there's so many signs of God, they never see Him. So we're trying to teach people about God, to understand there is God. But the atheists, they don't like to accept that there can be God. And then the, you have people who are called impersonalists. And the impersonalists said, they will say, we're all God. They will say, everyone's God. I am God, you are God, we are all God. Mm. They're saying like that. And ultimately God is simply light. They say, they will argue like that. So if everyone is God, then there's no meaning to God anymore. Because when we look in the deep, God means the Supreme Person, one above everyone. But impersonalists, they say, no, everyone's God, it's all one, it's all the same. Then everyone's God. Then no meaning to God anymore. Doesn't mean anything, no point. So they are also atheists, the atheists and the impersonalists. And, they, they, and they, they both influence people. Very common to get these two kinds of people, atheists and impersonalists. The atheist, he says no God, and the impersonalist says everybody's God. So they're both teaching the wrong knowledge. They have no no real knowledge, there. it's only their own ignorance. But they influence people and they take people into hell by their teaching. So the atheist denies God, the impersonalists support the atheists by saying God is without personality. The, he says he has no personality, everybody's without personality. We're all God, and we're all part of the energy, of the oneness. I'm not a person, you're not a person, we're just all energy. And so Prabhupada is arguing against this. He says in the Sri Ishopanishad, there are so many things about God being a person, because we heard that He can run faster than anyone. Although He's in his abode, He can overcome all others running, so He can run faster than anyone. So he's a person. We have to understand how to deal with these kind of people. Go ahead. Who can read now? Who has not read? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, today I can read. Who is this? This is Jolene. Oh, Jolene, okay, yeah, please. 
the ignorant pseudo religionists and the manufacturers of so called incarnations who directly violate the Vedic injunctions are liable to enter into the darkest region of the universe because they mislead those who follow them. These impersonalists generally pose themselves as incarnations of God to fool persons who have no knowledge of Vedic wisdom. If such foolish men have any knowledge at all, it is more dangerous in their hands than ignorance itself. Such impersonalists do not even worship the demigods according to the scriptural recommendations. In the scriptures, there are recommendations for worshipping demigods under certain circumstances. But at the same time, these scriptures state that there is normally no need for this. In the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, text 23, it is clearly stated that the results derived from worshipping the demigods are not permanent. Since the entire material universe is impermanent, whatever is achieved within the darkest of material existence is also impermanent. The question is how to obtain real and permanent life. Okay, thank you. So the impersonalists, what is their approach to, to, to the, what are they teaching? Ignorant pseudo-religionists and the manufacturers of so-called incarnations enter into, because they mislead the people who follow them. So. Impersonalists generally pose themselves as incarnations of God to foolish persons. So somebody may say like that, that they're an incarnation of God. How will we deal with them? What will we do? We can offer obeisances to them, right? If they're an incarnation of God, oh, please accept my humble obeisances. I'm so lucky I could meet God, <laughs> right? No. What should we do? How should we deal with them? You ask them questions? What? We ask them questions. Hare Krishna Maharaj? Maharaj, we, we can't hear you, Maharaj. I'm here, I can hear. I can't hear who's... Okay, Maharaj, can. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. What did you want to say, Maharaji? What were you going to say? Can we ask them questions? What questions? Why are you saying that you are a god? What qualifications do you have? Uh -huh. Show your universal form. Yeah, you can ask them to show the universal form. Krishna showed the universal form. Mariji, you got to do something about your mic, you know. You're really giving us a hard time here with your microphone. When you speak, you can't understand what you say. So somebody says they're an incarnation of God, it should be mentioned in the scriptures. The information on the incarnations of God is all there in the scriptures. So if somebody's an incarnation, they should actually, it should be stated there, they should be described where they take birth and what their activity, what they'll do. So incarnations of God are all mentioned in the scriptures. But these people, they don't have any knowledge of Vedic scriptures. They're so, so foolish, they claim they're God. So Prabhupada said, if they have any knowledge at all, it's more dangerous than being ignorant. The better they're just ignorant. 
because whatever they know, they will use it in the wrong way. And the impersonalists, they worship the demigods. They do not worship the demigods in the proper manner. They will do it their own way. But if you're going to worship the demigods, we have to do it up in the proper manner, according to the scriptures. So there's a need to, we, we want to worship the demigods, we should worship them according to the scriptures. No, you can't just invent your own way, just do everything how you think it should be done. You have to follow scripture. So the results from worshipping the demigods are not permanent. The entire material universe is impermanent. So how to get real life, permanent life? So this is described now. Okay, uh, uh, who's, who's not read yet? What about Keshava Damodar Prabhu? Is he there? Can you read? No? Nantini, you can read. Can you hear me? Yes. The Lord states that as soon as one reaches Him by devotional service, which is one and only way to approach the personality of Godhead, one attains complete freedom from the bondage of birth and death. In other words, the path of salvation from the material cultures fully depends on the principles of knowledge and detachment gained from serving the Lord. The pseudo-religionists have neither knowledge nor detachment from material assets, for most of them want to live in the golden shackles of material bondage under the shadow of philanthropic activities disguised as religious principles. By a false display of religious sentiments, they present a show of devotional service while indulging in all sorts of immoral activities. In this way, they pass as spiritual masters and devotees of God. Such violators of religious principles have no respect for the authoritative acharyas, the holy teachers in the strict disciplic succession. They ignore the basic Vedic injunction, Acharya Pasana. One, one must worship the Acharya and Krishna's statement in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, text 2, Evam Parampara Praktam. The supreme science of God is received through the disciplic succession. Instead, to mislead the people in general, they themselves become so-called Acharyas, but they do not even follow the principles of the Acharyas. Okay, so what is important? They, are, they want to, if they want to get free from material bondage, what is necessary? Devotional service. And when you do devotional service, what qualities will you get? Knowledge and detachment. Yes. Remember I said earlier this evening, knowledge, jnana and detachment, vairagya. These two things, they follow wherever there is proper devotion. So we want to approach Krishna. We have to approach him by devotional service. So we want to get this kind of knowledge and detachment, and we get it by doing service to Krishna. But these so-called people who are religious, they don't have knowledge and they don't have detachment. They just want to enjoy the material world, and they make a show of religion. Sometimes they even make a show of devotional service, but it, sometimes they're doing also immoral things. So in this way, they create a very bad situation, give people a very bad impression about religion. They think, just like Karl Marx, Karl Marx, he wrote about communism, the socialist philosophy, said religion is the opium of the people. He said like that. He said that the opium of the people is like a drug. He said it was not good for the people. 
because he didn't see, he only saw bad things coming from religious people, so-called religious people. They were all cheaters, they were all bad people, they were not honest people. So the, prop, the, the, the actual process is, you must approach the Acharya, Acharya Pasanam. You have to worship the Acharya. This is it. Bhagav, from the Bhagavad Gita. We have to follow the disciplic succession. Parampara praptam. The, the science is received through the disciplic succession. But even Lord Krishna says, Yoga nashta parantapa, that the knowledge was lost. In course of time, the knowledge was lost. Krishna had to come again to re establish it. So, we have to be very careful to follow carefully, not to change anything. But these people, they become the acharyas. They don't, they don't follow the real principles of the acharyas, but they become the acharya. Okay, Rukmini Pati Prabhu, you can read this last paragraph for us. Okay, Maharaj, thank you. These rogues are the most dangerous elements in human society. Because there is no religious government, they escape punishment by the law of the state. They cannot, however, escape the law of the Supreme, who has clearly declared in the Bhagavad Gita that envious demons, the god of religious propagandists, shall be thrown into the darkest regions of hell. Bhagavad Gita, chapter 16. Three ISO findings are confirmed that these pseudo religionists, religionists are heading towards the most omnicious place in the universe after the completion of their spiritual master business, which they conduct simply for sense gratification. So you can see Prabhupada is writing very strongly here. Prabhupada is saying very strongly. I said, the most, these rogues, the most dangerous elements in human society, you know, they're doing such a bad thing in the name of religion. And what are they trying to do? They're, they're just simply making a business, making a business out of religion, out of the spiritual master business. And they're just doing it for their own sense gratification. So it's very bad creates a very bad... That's why many people become atheists, because they think there's no real religion, there's no proper rule, everybody's a cheater. So this is what happens, this is the problem. So there has to be proper standard. But, but Prabhupada said the government, they don't check it. There's no religious government. They don't keep a check of what people are teaching, what's being taught to the people. But Prabhupada said, Krishna knows. They cannot escape the law of the Supreme. So they'll be punished by Krishna. And the, the punishment will be, they'll go put into the darkest regions. So like that. So you, we can escape from the government but you cannot escape from the supreme government, from the universal government, the law of the supreme. He knows everything, he sees everything. We cannot escape from him. So in this way Prabhupada is describing the problem here, that people worshipping different things, some people worshipping demigods, some people worshipping the impersonal and creating so many problems, not giving the real knowledge. Okay, we will stop here tonight. Did you get that file I sent about the impersonalists and the personalists? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, did you look through it? You can see the difference between the impersonalist and the personalist? Yeah? Yes, yes Maharaj. Okay. okay, so we'll stop here. We'll go on tomorrow.
Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you, Maharaj. 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 Hare Krishna.